Good afternoon. I'm Dan Stein, and I'm here with Dale Wilcox, who's the executive director and general counsel of the Immigration Reform Law Institute. I'm president of FAIR, and today we're going to be talking about some issues that I know are going to be of interest to you. As many of you know, uh, we're going to be talking about Chris Kobach, guy who's running for governor in Kansas, and it looks like it's nip and tuck with the incumbent governor. Uh, but we have every confidence Chris Kobach looks like he might pull it off and be the Republican nominee for governor of Kansas in the upcoming election later this, uh, later this year. For quite a while, uh, Chris Kobach worked as of counsel for the Immigration Reform Law Institute. Here to talk about that work and talk a little bit about the criticisms that have been leveled at Mr. Kobach in the weeks and months preceding the election, uh, Dale will be here to discuss it. And so, Dale. Also, I want to remind you that I am here on the page, and I am sitting here looking down on the page, and now anxiously awaiting your questions and comments, because we're not, not only going to be talking about Chris Kobach and the president's endorsement of Chris, we're also going to be talking about an important case many of you may have read about. A district judge, Judge Bates here in the District of Columbia, has ordered a restart of an Obama-era program that was illegal in the first place, the so-called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. We're going to explore that case, lead plaintiff NAACP and Princeton Universities. NAACP, you ask, what are they doing bringing a lawsuit on behalf of people here who were illegally here and who are arguably still illegally here under <coughs> DACA? We'll talk about that case and also how that case interrelates to some other cases that are of interest in the legality of the DACA program. But first, let's talk a little bit about Chris Kobach. Dale, uh, yes. what do you say, uh, what did Chris do for, for early? And talk a little bit about these attacks from uh, sure. ProPublica and some members of the news media about that work. Sure. Chris has been counsel with uh, the Immigration Reform Law Institute for many years, since 2006, I believe. And um, essentially what Chris, Chris is a brilliant lawyer, highly trained, um, Yale Law School, I believe, Oxford trained. Lawyer. Oh, yeah, he's got blue chip credentials. Oh, blue absolutely. Chip credentials, right? Brilliant lawyer, which explains why the opposition is going after him, because anytime Chris argues a case, uh, everyone sits up and pays attention. Uh, Chris has for years worked with us when we've litigated important cases, so he's acted somewhat as an outside uh, contracted counsel for us. So he was actually of counsel for early for quite some time. Yes, that's and true. And he, he, he did help... Um, was the architect at some level of a strategy of helping municipalities defend important initiatives and resolutions that were promoted by local citizens to actually help right. integrate their local enforcement with federal immigration law. Absolutely, right? many and years. And he was one of the only people out there doing this, right? Yeah, absolutely. For many years, he worked with Early hand in hand, and we uh, crafted uh, pro enforcement legislation for various states. And in fact, Chris had a major part in drafting Arizona's SB 1070. Right. And specifically the provision that was upheld by the Supreme Court, which of course, you know, the opposition will argue, well, three provisions were struck down, but many more were not challenged that were, that, uh, uh, were in the bill. So um, you spoke of unfair attacks and that's what the opposition well, is doing. He did work in Hazleton in Pennsylvania, yes. Farmers yes. Branch in, Tennis, in Texas. Fremont, Nebraska. Fremont, Nebraska. Basically, practically all by himself and our beleaguered little team at the Immigration yes. Reform Law Institute to work to try to help bring these cases, defend municipalities and states uh, in their effort to try to ensure immigration laws are enforced, right? Correct. And so the, yes. the, the, this organization called ProPublica, I don't know how many people here are familiar with ProPublica, it's a nonprofit organization masquerading as a news organization. They're just an investigative hit job outfit, totally biased. And the news media today are really no longer the news media. They're really adjuncts of congressional or political campaigns. Uh, they don't even try it because they're exempted from campaign finance reform. Smart people figured out that they would take control of newspapers and turn them into campaign platforms. And that's all they really are now. ProPublica is a nonprofit that serves these campaign positions. And so after ProPublica did this criticism, investigation of Kobach, that story has appeared in various forms in about five or six newspapers. Kansas City Star, New York Times, Rolling Stone, Slate, all your very objective newspapers. <laughs> what was the substance of ProPublica's criticism of Kobach? Well, what case? they wanted to do was they wanted to show how Chris formed his reputation and basically off the backs of poor cities, 
um, where uh, they, they had that legislation struck down and in the end had to pay substantial attorney's fees, judgments uh, to the ACLU or whoever was challenging so, those. So in your experience, how much money has the ACLU made, basically, <laughs> from the government in litigating immigration cases in the last oh, 30 years. Oh, multiplied millions of dollars. Millions and millions of dollars. Oh, yes. yes. And of course, there are immigration lawyers who make a lot of money right. suing, right? Absolutely. And there's a lot of immigration lawyers and other people who make money bringing in immigrants, right? Selling so H-1B visas. So right. here you have one small group early, the Immigration Law Institute, and you have a guy like Chris Kobach, yeah. intrepid, pioneer, innovative cases, has a difficult time in some of these jurisdictions, innovating precedent, but taking bold and inventive new initiatives. These municipalities wound up having to pay, and of course he obviously wanted to get paid for his legal services. Is it a credible argument to say that Kobach got into this business to make money, to get rich? Absolutely not. <laughs> he's, he's doing this in his spare time, mind you. He has a day job. So when he's well, doing he's the his, Secretary of State of Kansas. Yeah, yeah. So he has a day job. So he is he's also a law professor. He really he's a true believer, a true immigration reformer. So he's doing this for the country. Absolutely. And yet which newspapers again repeated this charge in the last two weeks? I've seen it in the Times. New York Times. Yeah, New York Times. Kansas uh, City Star. Yeah. Yeah. Where it was like five or six yeah, papers. five or six papers. Rolling and of course Stone, because Slate. of his connection with us, they were all over us trying to get information digging around trying to find some dirt on Kobach and it's obvious in the final push of his campaign they wanted to come out with this smear to uh, sway the electorate. Well Janine Goodwin says the news media is deranged and due to their bias they are misinforming people in the US and poisoning them and I'd like to see more of your comments but I can't but I gotta say it looks like a very good comment. Um, and yes, I mean, that's a very good observation. Uh, and, and I have to say we all agree with that. So, <laughs> Absolutely. But Kobach looks like he may win, right? What's it look like? Um, so far, with all the votes tallied, all precincts in, he's up 191 votes. <laughs> that's a comfortable margin <laughs> in somebody's business. Uh, that's with all the, so there's some provisional ballots. There are provisional right? ballots out there. There are actually absentee ballots, I believe. They have until Friday to get those in. If they were postmarked on, by election day, so the actual vote counting will be finished Friday. However, if the tally remains close as it is, there's likely to be a recount, and that will go on for weeks. All right, well, we're all, of course, uh, looking at that race with a great deal of interest, mm -hmm. and anybody who would doubt the uh, integrity of Chris Kobach or mm -hmm. the impact that he has made uh, on behalf of the American people throughout the country I mean, certainly would be happy to see him elected governor, no doubt about it. Oh, now, we do not endorse candidates, but the fact is we've had a, a good long institutional association mm. with Chris Kobach and uh, believe that he is a person who is above reproach and a man of very strong integrity who simply takes an enlarged view of the national interest. In fact, Chris has been involved in helping out with this case in Brownsville with Judge Hannon, moving to the, the question of deferred action for mm. childhood arrivals. Um, once again, we see, in this case, the NAACP and Princeton University and a range of plaintiffs bringing a lawsuit here in D.C. to try to stop the president from stopping, suspending the illegal and unconstitutional DACA program. And we now have a case that orders the president to not only restart the program, but take in new applications. And the obvious question is, if a program's illegal, how can a judge order the restart of an illegal program when it was illegal when it was began? You're Gail? absolutely right. Why don't you give a little insight? <laughs> well, uh, oh, by the way, Sherry Flowers is saying yes. illegal aliens is the term. And we want to applaud the administration, Department of Justice, yes. for saying it's not undocumented workers, it's not inadvertent transborder migrants, it's not whatever you want, it's illegal aliens, right? Right. Uh, Sherry, let, let me state, um, we knew this opinion that we received last Friday from the U.S. District Court here in D.C. was going off the rails as of footnote one. Footnote one, the judge footnoted the term undocumented, and he had it in a nice footnote there that there's some discussion about what is the proper term, but since some people, their feelings get hurt when you use illegal alien, I'm going to use undocumented throughout the opinion. So we knew right there, we located the judge, what his sympathies were. 
this, this opinion that was dropped Friday went further than any other opinion that's been issued thus far in the DACA cases, um, um, uh, enjoining President Trump from rescinding DACA. Those previous cases, one in California, one in New York, the judges there merely said, you've got to renew DACA applications. Okay, the rescission was unlawful, you've got to continue to renew DACA applications. On Friday, this judge went further and said, not only do you have to accept renewals, you have to accept new applicants to the DACA program. And even further, you have to grant them advanced parole when they want to leave the country and go visit their families On abroad. the basis, when there was no, first of all, there's no, first of all, I want to just say, Ken Gunnett says, I was an ICE officer and tried to open a couple of cases on illegal voting. I was told that this was a state issue and not to do anything, okay? <laughs> Thank you for trying, Ken. And the fact of the matter is Chris Kobach has worked mightily, more than anyone in the United States, to try to get at this question of illegal voting patterns and illegal voting registration. No doubt about that. Well, in, in fact, in Kansas, uh, he helped shepherd through a bill that uh, uh, required proof of citizenship to register to vote. And of course, the ACLU and et al. have um, um, brought lawsuits to challenge that. And currently, that's in litigation. So Everything is in litigation. Everything's in litigation. Well, I mean, we need to do a separate Facebook Live, Dale and me and some others, to talk about this question of judicial activism. Generally, the very transparent, the radical departure from judicial restraint and trying to attack everything Donald Trump is trying to do on the immigration front. But getting back to this case here in the D.C. Circuit, really have to say, hmm. If there's no legal authority for the program, how can a judge order that they restart it? What the judge ruled is, under the Administrative Procedure Act, the government did not give a sufficient reason why they wanted to rescind the program. Okay. So he has called their it's judge... It's illegal. It's unconstitutional. Yeah. That's not a good enough reason? <laughs> he wouldn't even get to that question. He actually didn't get to whether he, DACA is legal or not. He was concerned about the inconvenience, right? To the illegal aliens. Well, that so they was, would be inconvenienced by having their status revoked. That was, uh, a, yes, that was a separate part of his opinion where he said the government didn't take into consideration the reliance interests of the hundreds of thousands of people who are currently on DACA. Reliant, that means it would be inconvenient. Exactly. That they were but, promised something, even though Obama said, you're right. Obama said this is not a permanent solution, could be yep. revoked. Well, you're absolutely right. If you look at uh, Janet Napolitano's DACA memo that created DACA in the first place, the she was, final uh, Obama's first DHS secretary, Janet the, Napolitano. The final paragraph says this memo creates no right in law. So to say that you have a reliance interest that you're relying on this, that it could, it said it could, it could be withdrawn at any time. So if I buy a vacuum cleaner and the vacuum cleaner comes with a sticker on it that says, this vacuum cleaner may not work. <laughs> it doesn't suck. <laughs> and I get home and it doesn't work. Can I go back to the store and say I want to return it because it doesn't suck? No, you bought it as is. Okay. You knew when you bought it. Buyer beware, caveat <laughs> emptor. Okay? That's right. So where does this judge get off doing this? He's wrong. He's wrong. And in fact, uh, there, was a, uh, there are actually five DACA cases currently. Um, there was actually a judge, a case brought in the District of Maryland, where the judge has found the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. The government said DACA is illegal. We're going to rescind it. That judge says, the government says it's illegal. It looked at the Fifth Circuit case that ruled that DAPA and extended DACA were illegal. And, um, and, and the Attorney judge General say Sessions there needed to, The judge in this case said there need to be a balancing test. The inconvenience to the alien, the benefit that they provide because they're here and all That's that true. kind of stuff versus the government's That's interest, true. not the public interest, yes. but the government's interest in efficiency in revoking the status, as if the public yes. has no interest in the enforcement right. of immigration laws, right? You're absolutely right, yes. Why is the NAACP interested in this anyway? It I thought well, the NAACP <laughs> was involved in trying to advance people who were here who were people of color, who were descendants of slaves. Isn't that why that organization was founded? Yes. Or is this like mission creep? It, it, it boggles the mind because as we know that uh, um, when you inject more low-skilled workers into the workforce, who does it hurt? It hurts the vulnerable. It hurts the poor. And you would think the NC, uh, <laughs> NA, uh, and double a and double double ACP, ACP. excuse me, um, would, would be interested in advancing um, jobs for, for those people of color. 
But they, they're, they're well, in so fact, enraged. If you're checking our Facebook feed out, FAIR's new big national ad campaign for wages to rise, immigration must fall. There's about eight or nine ads that are running on our Facebook platform. You should scroll down and check out those ads. Get a lot of great feedback, and it's going to go national all month. So keep your eye out for those. Yeah, apparently we have to do the job the NAACP <laughs> won't do. So how do we stop this judge? Well, thankfully, um, Texas and six other states have filed a lawsuit in uh, the Southern District of Texas where, uh, and in fact, the case was assigned to Judge Hainan, the judge who struck down Obama's DAPA and extended DACA program. Um, we anticipate that he's going to rule and he's going to declare DACA unlawful. And when he does that, he can enjoin it nationally. So how can and that he, will end this. He enjoins it nationally. Why doesn't this guy enjoin it nationally? Well, when did district judges decide they could just enjoin nationally all kinds of stuff just because it's a federal law and they somehow think that, I mean, we're, isn't there jurisdiction only in that district? Well, you know, the argument can be made that we're dealing with immigration and we're supposed to only have one body of law when it comes to immigration, so we want a consistent body across the United States. So that's the argument that was made actually in Texas versus USA that struck down DAPA when Hainan issued that, that national well, injunction. I didn't there. say national injunctions are yeah. bad. Yeah. It's just that when I agree with them, they're okay. <laughs> I am, you know. Anyway, um, there's a distinction between the, there's a, there's a DACA case, a DACA, uh, the, a challenge of the rescission in California and New York. There was one in Maryland, but the Maryland judge found against DACA and said the rescission was lawful. And then there's the one in DC. Then you have Judge Hainan. Now these other cases are challenging the rescission of DACA under the APA. Judge Hainan- It wasn't issued under the APA. It was just issued as a memo. It now, was, you're it, saying the Administrative mm, Procedure Act yeah. is supposed to protect mm. Americans from arbitrary government action. So it lays out rules and regulations that guide how and when the government can change policy, provides notice and opportunity for comment, and those kinds of things. Anytime the ACLU doesn't like something, anytime any of those organizations don't like a change in immigration policy, the first argument they make, first argument is it's unconstitutional. The second argument is they violated the Administrative Procedure Act, right? Right, okay. right. So those cases that are challenging the rescission of DACA by Trump, um, the, the courts there are only analyzing his rescission action. What Hainan's looking at in the case in Texas, and of course the uh, intervening uh, defendants there are arguing that it's not valid, but what the plaintiffs there are arguing is that Hainan can judge whether DACA itself is unlawful. Right. And if that's unlawful, he can enjoin <clears throat> the DACA program. And it doesn't conflict with these other judges' decisions ruling on Trump's rescission. So Hainan will be judging DACA, the underlying DACA program, where these other judges are only looking at Trump's but way of going about judge, rescinding. Isn't, isn't it relevant if I'm a judge to do an analysis that first looked at whether the initial program was legal in the first place? Because the legal question of whether a rescission was legal should depend upon whether or not the initial act was legal in the first place. Or am I just stupid? <laughs> Maybe I'm just stupid. I would agree with you. No, you know, you don't agree with that. I'm not stupid. <laughs> no, not not that uh, you're stupid. I would agree that the judges, the judges uh, should look at the underlying policy. Obviously, if DACA is illegal, what are they going to do? Okay, what are they going to order the administration to reinstate an illegal program? No, you should go back to the status quo ante. To the beginning, right before DACA existed. Exactly, which means there's no DACA. Exactly. All right, Judge Hannon, so he issues an injunction nationwide, stops this case, stops all the others. Then there's an appeal. Yes, Okay. to Hannon's, the Fifth Circuit. Right, so Hannon is called heinous, and they move it up yes. to the Fifth Circuit. They uphold it, probably. Likely they will. It goes to the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. How many years is that going to take? Um, let's see, in the DAPA litigation, it took us about a year to get there. So the whole strategy of the ACLU is to try to survive. Delay, delay, delay. delay Obstruct and delay. Hoping they can get Trump out. Yes. Now, the fact that Trump endorsed Kobach, even though the establishment Bush wing of the party did not want him to endorse Kobach, what does that tell us about Trump's commitment to this issue? Trump is a true believer. He's committed to this issue. This is his top issue. We are so busy right now with litigation at the Immigration Reform Law Institute because... 
The opposition is suing him left and right to stop everything he's doing. This is his number one issue. Well, so the Immigration Reform Law Institute is involved in virtually every major case the ACLU is attacking the Trump administration on, right? That's correct. Without the Immigration Reform Law Institute, there would be no who one <laughs> would be helping the Trump administration to defend what they're doing in court. There would be no one. In fact, um, we regularly submit briefs to the Board of Immigration Appeals, which is the highest court to consider uh, immigrants' appeals. Um, the Board of Immigration Appeals is called the BIA. We call it that. Right. That's the one that Jeff Sessions has some management of, right? That's Correct. That's the one where he can take Correct. their decisions and kind of change them when he wants to. Correct. And he requested briefing on an issue recently. In fact, it was the uh, whether domestic violence and uh, gang-related private criminal activity constitutes grounds for asylum. And the attorney general said, no, no, it doesn't. Um, it's not one of the five enumerated grounds for asylum. Um, and um, he noted in that opinion that he had 14 amicus briefs. 13 ruled the other way. Mm -hmm. One ruled with him. That was us. So that means you have outsized influence. Absolutely. Paul, Paul Calicott says, laws are created in the legislature. Laws are created in the legislature. Paul, is that true or false, Dale? Well, that should be true. But it's not. <laughs> Where are laws created? <laughs> Sometimes laws can be created by the executive, but unlawfully. I think they're being created by the judiciary. Okay? Well, this Isn't is true. true. This is true. This is the judicial usurpation of the legislature. One of the reasons, as you notice, as the Supreme Court has gotten more involved in sociological, judicial decision-making, the Congress has become more quiescent, less active, and less relevant in the United States. Would you say right. that's true? Yes, absolutely right. The American people are allowing a, a judicial system that is immune from political responsiveness to make our laws effectively. And that's what's happening now in the DACA cases, right? It's that's sad. what's happening yes. in the travel ban yeah. cases. Yeah. Trump's got a new appointee to potentially run ICE, permanent nominee. Yes. This gentleman, uh, Vidiello, yes, is... Vidiello, is he good or bad? It, it, well, from what we can see, he's good. Um, I like it whenever I see a beat cop coming up through the ranks to take over uh, an upper echelon position in the agency, and this gentleman has 34-plus years mm -hmm. experience in the Border Patrol. And specifically, for many years, he was assigned to the Rio Grande Val uh, Valley sector, which is uh, probably our most porous sector uh, in the United States. So he's seen what's going on firsthand. He's like Thomas Ho Ho Homan, exactly. but without the vitamins. <laughs> All hell is going to break loose soon because the Trump administration has new regulations that basically say if you want to come here as an immigrant, you cannot use welfare. You cannot go on welfare. These regulations should be coming out any day. And already the sabers are rattling. Can you tell us a little about those proposed regulations? Well, we have um, in our um, immigration law statutes that say that if you are a new immigrant to the country, you should not use public benefits. Very. Let's go back 100 years, right? Public charge law, 1916. It says if you're going to come as an immigrant, you pull your own weight. If you have a sponsor, the sponsor is, is basically responsible. If you have emergency needs, non-emergency needs, if you need health care, whatever, that's the sponsor's job, not the taxpayer. Somehow that all got turned on its head. A lot of immigrants are coming now, getting on welfare. Probably more family immigrant-headed households are on welfare than the native-born families. So these, these regulations simply restore us back to the traditional idea. That's right. If you're going to come here, you don't get to use welfare. So what's the problem? Well, obviously, the opposition doesn't like that because it, <laughs> the open border agitators, it, it makes it tougher on immigrants to... Uh, to, to come here and uh, survive because they have to prove that they won't be a, a, a burden to the public, to taxpayers. So if you don't want immigrants to come here and get on welfare, your voice is going to be an important part of the comment process to try to make sure these regulations are supported by the American people when they are proposed. These regulations should be coming out soon. We've already seen a couple articles, hostile of course, on yes. NBC News. Those of us who are old enough to remember when the news media was the news media remember that there was some objective impartiality back when the Fairness Doctrine was created. Campaign finance reform, courtesy of John McCain, does not include the so-called media. Well, anybody with the brains of a chicken figured out that if you could get control of what looked like the news media, like the Washington Post, 
and convert it into a nonstop 24 hour a day political party or organ, it would be outside the regulation of campaign finance reform and therefore could campaign away under the rubric of, you know, news media. And a lot of that's what's happened to our traditional news media. You know, cable news now, CNBC, Morning Joe, Joe Scarborough, <laughs> that isn't cable news, okay? That's cable campaigning. This is 24 hour a day campaign spots masquerading as news, immune from campaign finance reform. Anybody who believes that cable news exists anymore is living in dreamland. I agree. But that doesn't mean there are still not effective ways on social media platforms or publishers like Facebook and others to get the word out. And we're getting the word out to you today on important issues. Chris Kovacs, a potential nominee as a Republican governor, this important case in D.C. and sub AACP or Princeton University versus Trump. And now, of course, these new regulations coming out the public charge regulations, you can find an excellent article on FAIR's blog, immigrationreform.com, tell you all about the public charge, as they call it, the no welfare for immigrants regulations coming out by Spencer Raley, came out yesterday. Take a look at that. And if you want to know more about Early's work, of course, it's irli.org, early.org. Fabulous organization, affiliate of FAIR's. And I want to thank you so much, Dale, for joining us. We had a great time. And we'll be back with you soon for another edition of FAIR's Facebook Live.